Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the webinar, Global Growth Potential of Energy Efficient Data Centers, hosted by the Copenhagen Center on Energy Efficiency. My name is Wang Xiao. I will be serving as your moderator for today. In this webinar, we have invited experts and thought leaders from national and international organizations to share their knowledge, expertise, and insights on the benefits in introducing energy efficiency in data centers and global development trend of energy efficient data centers. We will also look at what innovative technologies and solutions are available in high impact markets, what types of supporting policies and strategies that proved to be instrumental for the transition of data centers to be more energy efficient and sustainable. And now, please allow me to invite our first speaker, Ms. Gabriela Prata Diaz, acting head of the Copenhagen Center on Energy Efficiency, to lead us into a sustainable development path of the data centers. Gabriela. Hi, and welcome to our webinar on global growth potential for energy efficient data centers. First, I would like to give a brief presentation about our organization uh, within UNEP DTU partnership and also a bit on, uh, of an overview of uh, what activities we are doing and uh, how do we see the future opportunities uh, where they lie regarding energy efficiency in the ICT industry and most specifically on the data center industry. So the Copenhagen Center on Energy Efficiency is part of a UNEP DTU partnership. This is an association between UN Environment, the Danish Technical University and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Denmark. So this is part of a tripartite agreement between these three organizations. As an institutional background, uh, we are also a collaborating center supporting UN environment and we are already quite experienced uh, because we've been uh, developing our activity for the last 27 years. We count with a team of about 65 economists and scientists for more than 26 different nations and we work mostly on uh, developing countries. We are part, as I mentioned already, of uh, DTU Management and Engineering, so Technical University of Denmark, and we work with a wide network of collaborating institutions and partners in more than 50 developing countries. We are officially a non-profit uh, public institution with highest standards and procedures, transparency and accounting. The main uh, goal of our activity is to perform uh, in line with the Sustainable Development Goals uh, UN initiative and basically we work towards uh, SDG 7, so Sustainable Development Goal 7, which is affordable and clean energy and also uh, SDG goal number 13, climate action. So these are the main drivers of our activity and we focus uh, mostly uh, on, on energy efficiency, targeting uh, mitigation actions, so mitigation through energy efficiency and, uh, and energy efficiency as such uh, under uh, SDG 7. We are also the energy efficiency hub of the Sustainable Energy for All initiative, which uh, also is in line with the Sustainable Dev Development Goals and has three main pillars of activity. The first one is ensuring universal access to modern energy services and another one on doubling the global rate of improvement in energy efficiency, which is the most relevant to our work. And the final one, a third one on doubling the share of renewable energy in the global energy mix. The Copenhagen Center on Energy Efficiency, as I mentioned, is one of the big activities of the UNEP DTU partnership and has also three main uh, pillars with the main objective of accelerating energy efficiency programs uh, of cities and countries. And for that, we base our knowledge and work uh, a lot on what is considered as best practices and 
best case studies and best solutions and technologies. So we work towards activating the knowledge base on energy efficiency. We also work directly with the public sector, I mean cities, municipalities, countries, and the private sector. So we aim towards public-private implementation projects. That really means uh, coming up projects coming up on the ground. And then with the, our success stories, we try to replicate them um, in other places, uh, so other developing countries and emerging economies. And we do that through uh, communicating our success. One of the initiatives uh, that we normally do under this third pillar is the webinar, like the one we are doing today. We, as a, uh, the Energy Efficiency Hub of the Sustainable Energy for All, we are also uh, the Global Energy Efficiency Accelerator Platform Coordinator. This means that there are, at the moment, uh, a few uh, accelerator platforms, which are public-private partnerships on specific energy efficiency topics. And these are, uh, if we come from the top, uh, buildings. So we're focusing very much on energy efficiency in buildings. And another one on district energy. And another one on lighting appliances and equipment, which uh, is merged with the one below that you can see uh, below. There is another one on industry and the final one focusing on vehicle fuel efficiency. So these are associations between the public sector and the private sector with most relevant and uh, competent companies that really operate in this field. And as the Copenhagen Center on Energy Efficiency, we manage uh, and do a kind of a secretariat to this platform of energy efficiency accelerators. We do a lot on communication, coordination, and tracking activities and results, and some cross-sectoral funding um, uh, approaches that we also uh, are engaged with. So the main objective of this platform is to engage cities and countries to take commitments on energy efficiency action in the different areas that are mentioned, so buildings, district energy, lighting, etc and to help them evaluate the opportunities for action where the, the most energy efficiency potential is lying, to identify where this, is, this potential is lying, to develop a strategy and plans to improve uh, the situation in these cities and countries, to help them to build the enabling environment. This means local legislation, regulations that should be in place uh, uh, for, for the concrete implementation of these solutions and also uh, in the final term, so formulating initiatives and uh, moving towards investment, which is, which is the, the, the ultimate objective. And with that, we hope to achieve uh, municipal and national global energy efficiency objectives and work towards the sustainable development goals, as I mentioned in the beginning. Regarding uh, energy efficiency in data centers, why are we approaching this topic? Um, we are actually uh, seeing an increase in the amount of data demand and, we, and, for, and because of that, uh, for more processing and storage space needed. So uh, people are more and more using their uh, mobile phones uh, and also mm, other tablets and, and computing moving resources. So, uh, and the amount of data that is transferred among, among citizens is, is increasing uh, very rapidly and uh, within a big um, rate of development. And this impacts on the growth in the global data center construction market because we need more and more space and more and more computing uh, power to, to process and store this, this large amount of data that is being transferred and processed uh, around the world. And that, of course, has an impact on the amount of energy that's currently consumed and, and, and is putting pressure on the global supply of, of electricity and also consequently on the global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and, and, then, and then for that uh, impact on, on climate change. So uh, in, 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 in a nutshell, what we aim to do is to address the growing energy appetite of data centers 
uh, to, to spike the share of global electricity consumption in the next decade. So we, na we aim to, to address this topic and see how can uh, data centers better perform um, in this uh, energy demand um, um, sector. Where do you think uh, do we think uh, the opportunities lie? Um, we see there's uh, a huge uh, demand for for construction of new data centers, so greenfield data center construction in in developing countries. So we we could easily look at uh, countries, for example, like China and India, and also in Latin America and and uh, certainly Africa. So. There is an, a growing appetite for, for data center construction, for new data centers, so that all this information that is being shared among citizens could be transferred and stored and processed around the world. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, so aid cooperation, so we do it in the, in, in the perspective of aid cooperation with developing countries, so that the new data centers and new facilities and equipment that is actually used could be the most sustainable one, the most efficient one. We see also an opportunity in retrofitting existing data centers, uh, both public and private data centers. So uh, there, there are certainly some uh, existing infrastructure that need to be um, um, upgraded and retrofitted so that can accommodate the new technologies and the new solutions. And we see it here as, as a big opportunity for improving also the energy efficiency of the existing infrastructure. Uh, and here we are addressing uh, the all sorts of, uh, of sizes of uh, data centers from uh, hyperscale, large scale uh, um, data centers to the medium and even small size data centers. There's a huge opportunity uh, to address uh, also the, the, the mini and micro scale data centers that are, uh, that are existing around the world, which of course uh, have uh, implications on, on the refrigerating needs to, to cool down these data centers and even perhaps some lighting uh, that could also be more efficient. And uh, we do it uh, as well in the context of the upcoming digitalization of everything, Internet of Things. So we see uh, a, a, an expanding network on, of smart cities and uh, new opportunities on, on smart appliances and smart homes and the introduction of the, 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 the electric vehicles and its connection to, to the grid and to the homes. So we see, uh, uh, as, as, in a, as in a system, we see a big opportunity here for, for um, work uh, improving the energy efficiency of all these uh, applications and of course smart data centers uh, which are the areas of work that we consider that could be uh, most interesting for 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 this area and where the energy efficiency opportunities lie uh, so these are listed here you can see you can have a look so but the main uh, strongest uh, topics could be on uh, management strategies so uh, um, how to better manage the whole overall system energy demands of, of data centers and then specifically addressing sustainable cooling so cooling is the major um, energy demand for, for for data centers but also we could perhaps include ventilation, so smart, sustainable power. So these data centers need uh, power. So uh, let's try to bring them the most sustainable one uh, based, for example, on renewable energies and also addressing efficient lighting, efficiency of processors and green ICT. This is very much at the level of uh, chips uh, used in, in computers. Um, also, we, we think there, there could be a, a, a big ground of work on minimum performance standards for data centers themselves and perhaps also on labeling of data centers, the development of policies and plans uh, at national or even regional or local level, and monitoring, reporting and verification activities so that we are sure that the the most energy efficient solutions are working properly and uh, delivering the results that they are expected to. And finally, uh, also 
looking at sustainable investment in, in green data centers, in, uh, in the most efficient ones, and training among perhaps many other activities that we could easily uh, find out. So this was uh, a basic uh, introduction that I would like to give to this to this webinar, and uh, we are happy uh, to to answer any questions that you may have regarding this issue. And our contacts is are there, so uh, please feel free to contact us. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Gabriela, for providing us an overall picture of why and how energy-efficient data centers could contribute to sustainable development. Now, let's move from the policy side to the technical side. Our next speaker, Dr. Julian Chen, has extensive experience in district heating and cooling development and also building efficiency design. He is a senior advisor in the Copenhagen Center on Energy Efficiency. And Dr. Chen, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Jordan Chen. I am a senior advisor in Copenhagen Center on Energy Efficiency. The center provides a broad range of multidisciplinary um, services for IDCs or Internet Data Centers and focuses on the analysis of and promotion of technologies of energy efficiency for IDCs. Today, I would like to talk about the Global Overlook and on Energy Efficiency Data Center, or IDCs, and I will provide an overlook of different energy saving technologies in IDCs um, for different, location, uh, different locations worldwide. Um, and after the talk, I would like to hear the feedback, any questions or comments from you. Thank you. So here we start with an overview of the, 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 the rise of the I, uh, Internet Data Centers, IDCs. Actually, um, the requirement for IDCs um, come from several um, requirements. Um, first of all is the digital technology, the cloud and mobile. You know, nowadays people use quite a lot of digital devices including cloud and mobile technology, sometimes without even knowing. We communicate with friends, con connect with colleagues, doing our banking, share happy memories, and check our commuting timetables. Digital technologies has grown as at a very fast rate than current infrastructures has allowed for, and 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 this is all supported by IDCs behind. And then the the second one is the Internet of Things (IoT). Um, IoT is the overarching term given to the internet working of all physical devices like smartphones and tablets, city sensors, vehicles, buildings, among others, into one mega network. This mega network is expected to reach an estimated 15 billion networked appliances globally by 2020. Data centers are key to unleashing the full potential of the IoT. And then the third one is to improve functionality. The digital age has called for the increased functionality of data centers. This is primarily con attributed to technological advances around data resilience and energy efficiency. Traditionally, IDCs were and unfriendly energy and environmental due to the constant use of cooling and the energy needed to power IT hardware. Technological improvements and increased use of renewable energy sources are shifting the, the deal. And we are now witnessing much more energy efficiency facilities. And the, the, the final one is the security. It is not only for the buildings themselves, but also for the data in IDCs. Data is a new currency for governments and businesses. It under, underpins services delivery and policy making. Data is being treated as a valuable assess, asset and in some um, instances a com commodity meaning it must be accurate, stored, um, stored sensibly, protected from unauthorized access and available when needed. 
and and also nowadays actually when when we um when when we when 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 we discuss with municipality and and then the municipality will develop a new district um, with the label of visualization and using the big data and then this is also a driving for in, in idcs multiple application create big data the feature from cisco um, 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 here shows examples of the amounts of data that will be generated by planes, automobiles, and buildings, among other things and systems under the framework of smart city. Um, cloud services are accelerated in part by the unprecedented amount of data being generated by not only people, but also machines and things. Six core researchers estimate that 600 gigabit will be generated by all people, machines, and things by 2020 from up from 140 gigabit um, generated in 2015. So actually, um, nowadays, IDCs are supporting this big data and visualization on uh, um, behind. So even though we cannot see it, we cannot feel it, but actually it's from the direct support of the IDCs. And here is a, a, a picture shows um, um, what's the what's the um, 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 different kinds of IDCs located in the world. Actually, um, um, in 2013, there's a map of IDCs, and as you can see on the left top, um, USA has the has the biggest market for IDC that is more than 1,000 IDCs in USA, and then Euro Europe have 500. And more, and and Asia as a new um economic uh, market, actually it's growing from two hundred in two thousand and thirteen, and 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 now all the market of the IDCs are expanding, and then in the in the left down actually um um it it, it shows how it can uh, how IDCs are connecting actually um we are connected by IDCs through fiber optics connections, and then uh, and then. And according to the figure, you can see that even though we cannot feel it, actually all the um, IDCs are collecting, um, and 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 then through the IDCs, we can connect to um, people, to data, to everything, and 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 also from the uh, right right button feature, you can see that okay, no matter IDC is uh, I, the development of. IDC is like um, um, growing very fast. No matter in big countries like USA or small regions like Hong Kong, we are all well connected by IDCs. Like in Hong Kong, it's a relatively small region, but they still have quite a lot of IDC data centers. 50, 56. And, and and according to the research to the IDC, actually we can say that um, 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 in the future there will be higher workloads in the IDC. Today we are looking at the IDCs already operating and make an expectation on what they will be like in the year of 2020. I mean, almost two years later. First of all, we will find that the workloads in IDCs increase quickly and will cap um, increasing. Traditional data centers are facing widespread changes as computing power and workload increases. Economic models change, new privacy and security policies and recognitions are introduced and the lead for improvements in green energy efficiency and reliability grow. And, 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 and some research state that by 2020, 92% of workloads will be processed by cloud data center or IDCs. 8% will be processed by traditional data center. Overall, IDC workloads will more than double um, from 2.6 uh, um, in 2015 to 2020. And however, Cloud workloads will more than triple from 3.2 um, nowadays to almost um, almost seven, seven um, um, almost 11.9 um, in 2020. The workload density um, for IDCs was 7.3 in 2015, as you can see in the feature, and will grow to 11.9 by 2020. 
um, 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 but for the for the traditional data centers, what node den density was 2.2 2 in 2015, and will only grow to 3.5 by 2020. So it's less developed um, for the traditional um, data centers. Um, so the increasing um, need for IDCs and cloud resources from both the business and consumer service perspective has led to the development of large scale um, cloud data centers or what we call hyperscale data centers or hyperscale IDCs. Um, hyperscale IDCs are increasingly dominating the cloud landscape nowadays. And as you can see from the feature, there's only 259 in in at the end of 2015 and then if you if you expect it to grow to 485 by 2020 and 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 at that time they will account for 83 percent of the public cloud server installed based on 2020 and 86 percent of public cloud workloads so so as you can as you can see here, um, around the world there are now um, between three hundred and ninety to four hundred hyperscale data centers. Um, according to some research, forty four percent of those data centers are located in United States, very very high um, percentage, and the less most prominent locations are China, Japan, and the UK, as you can see in the in the feature down there which together account for another 20% of the worldwide total. And hyperscale IDCs are considered to have a minimum of 5,000 servers or, or at least 10,000 square feet in size, but, but often they are, they are even larger. The data in the, in, in the chart um, 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 considered operations by 24 of the world's major cloud and internet service firms as you can see um, in, 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 the, in, in the left. And, and then they are, the, they are considered the um, most largest and, 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 and highest speed um, hyperscale data center in the world right now. So the, the, the IDCs in nowadays with higher workload and densities cannot be only considered as a single building when compared with traditional data centers. They are developed as a, like an IT park or a cluster of buildings with huge demand for reliable energy, many electricity and cooling and so on. And, and, and right now, actually, you can see from this, um, this research, actually, um, 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 nowadays in 2017, today, right now, actually, all the um, 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 hyperscale uh, only take account on 21% of all the um, servers, but in 2020, they will be like 47%. And, and also they will jump for the uh, processing power or data store or, and, and, and the traffic of data center almost double. So that means all the energy required for hyper, uh, hyperscale data center will also jump as well. So that would be a, definitely a focus on how to saving energy in this uh, hyperscale IDCs. And, and so we, we take a close look in what, what's, what kind of energy um, consumed in the IDCs. Um, uh, uh, according to the study of the uh, US um, um, Department of Energy and Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, um, it was estimated that the data center in the United States consumed 70 billion kilowatt hour of electricity in 2014, which is equal to 1.8% of the country's total energy consumption for the whole year. And along with the electric um, city demand, data centers or IDCs require significant water consumption during operation. Approximately 626 billion liters of water was estimated to be consumed in 2014 for, for IDCs in USA, with that number reaching 660 billion liters in 2020. So, so, that so we can say that um, data center has a high potential to save energy. And, and when we 
when we when we try to um break down what kind of energy or what kind of um equipments in the um IDCs will consume more energy, we can see that um um it can break down into several parts like um chillers for cooling, lighting, IT equipments, um power distribution um units essential or UPS essential. Yeah. So and, and, and then you can see that um all the all this energy consumed is um is uh, the, the aim of this um, energy consumption is to support the IT um, equipment and almost 33% uh, of the total energy consumption is related to chillers which will generate cooling and supply and, uh, and uh, cooling to the, indoor, uh, uh, to the indoor and maintain the indoor environment. So, so here is a a a, a statistic, uh, a, a statistic um, for energy consumption of different part different parts. So, fifty percent goes to space cooling, and fifteen percent goes to electrical um, losses, and then thirty five percent um goes to powering server equipment. So, uh, so, 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 so in in correspondently, we can say that okay, um, we can develop different kinds of energy efficiency um, technologies according to different these three main points. For example, for space cooling, we can consider um, outside air economics as yeah, or expand expanding um, temperature set points, efficiency cooling equipments, or or other like hot or cold ISOs. And then for electric uh, for electrical losses, we can we can we can develop efficiency hardware. Uh, we can optimize power distribution, and and for for pow powering servant um equipments, we can use virtualization um technology to help to improve or optimize this this equipment operations. So. So in, in 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 general, actually from from two thousand and 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 ten, actually, um, the date the IDC electric um usage, um uh, for the best expected uh and worth scenario are calculated, and and then you can see in the in in the figure here, um, um, um there are three different um electricity per data value. And 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 as expected, um, it will be from um, uh, if you if if you have an, at least five percent five percent annual saving for the, for the for the um energy consumption, and then the expected average efficiency will improve from one a uh, zero point one thirty five kilowatt hour per gigabyte in two thousand and ten to zero point zero one four kilowatt hour per gig gigabyte and and this also require to um to upscale the use of renewable energy high efficient it hardware and innovative cooling technologies so 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 i will introduce um, um several um potential energy efficiency um, technologies for uh, to improve the energy consumption in data centers in IDCs. And then first of all, um, goes to the cooling systems, which will consume 50 or more um, energy consumption in IDCs. And, and as you can see from the chart here, there are several um, advanced cooling technology that is a top, uh, uh, that is using to IDCs um but um um how how however um um when um even though there's a lot of innovative or um energy efficient um cooling technology out there actually when they when when the client or when the um uh, idc owner um construct the real building or develop the real project actually they 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 are more considering the investment instead of um, efficiency. So right now, actually, you can see that there's a, uh, a survey in 2014, and on the left, that is the most common, commonly used um, cooling technology, which is called hot or cold aisle. Um, that's that uh, it is used in more than 80% of the um, 
of the uh, IDCs, um, but this kind of technology can can only improve the 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 total PUE or total efficiency with only quite limited percentage and compared to the liquid um, cooling on the on the very right which is only um, used in 11 percent of IDCs um, the liquid cooling um, um, is a innovative um, high efficiency techno cooling technology that can directly cool down the chips and uh, uh, with more than 50% of um, cooling energy saving. But the price right now for liquid um, cooling is estimated as almost two or three times compared to hot um, or cold ISO for some um, research. And so, so you can see that um, even though um, uh, there's m there's a lot of high efficiency um, technology out there, um, the price or the investment is the, one of the main barriers to um, prevent them to use in real. And another low cost um, um, techno cooling technology is for the uh, use the free cooling from the location and and according to the um, recommendation of Ashray TC 9.9 .9, it is possible for IDCs to utilize year-round cooling or free cooling but um, um, and then this kind of technology can 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 reduce the annual average PUE um, by 20 to 30 percent but the problem for this technology is that it is it, it cannot be used everywhere it depends on the climate which is directly related to the location of your IDCs as you can see from the chart um, um, the, the the cold dark um, blue side means that you can you, you the, um, you have the higher pot uh, potential to use um, um, free cooling of um, uh, 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 and benefit from the outdoor climate. And then these areas are, are included Nordic countries, North American, and also Russia um, on those countries. And then they can use year-round free cooling um, um, from the, the, the climate. And another approach of free cooling is use um, re, uh, river or seawater to cool down, but they also have the limitations. Um, uh, um, the ma major one is how to, how to choose the right location to use free cooling. And another thing is um, 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 we can in integrate district energy system um, to, to help to in improve the primary energy efficiency in the data centers. Um, for example, um, we can use cogeneration system to apply um, electricity and cooling to IDCs. And, and in that case, the primary energy efficiency can be raised up to 70% compared compared to normal system of 40 percent and also there's a lot of um, discussion on how to use the waste heat from the IDCs and, and, and a lot of countries like Denmark like Nordic countries they are they are trying to use um, the waste heat from IDCs and then use heat pump to raise up this heat and then to support the nearby district heating system to heat the, 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 the families around and then this will will also improve the primary energy efficiency of the IDCs and as you can see from here this is a a a um, a, 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 a technical plan how to improve the primary energy efficiency of data center from 49% to 75% and here is all of my presentation uh, thank you for your attention and I'm I'm waiting for your feedback and comments. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chen, for sharing your insights and knowledge on this topic. According to research from CBRE, European data center market is set to grow by 15% in 2018, driven by a flurry of activity in London, Frankfurt, Amsterdam, and Paris markets. So next, we will take a close look at this region through a presentation delivered by Mr. Steve Halvey, Vice President of Open Compute Foundation, and Mr. John Laban, its European representative. Let's hear what they have for us.
All right, I'd like to welcome everyone to the, uh, to the session today on, um, on how openness is driving efficiency in data centers. And it's a, a view from, from the Open Compute Project. Wanted to take just a minute to introduce ourselves. My name is Steve Helby, and I'm part of the full-time team at Open Compute, uh, based in London, focused primarily on channel development, which involves end customer adoption, um, our end contributors, as well as our reseller channel. And I've been with the foundation about uh, four years. And John? Hello, I'm John LeBan. I represent uh, the non-profit OCP Foundation in the European region. I have a, an extensive background on uh, data center facilities and a considerable expertise in energy efficiency in data centers, which I hope to bring to this presentation. Great. So just a thought to, to help uh, level set everyone uh, for this presentation, that if current OCP designs and practices were applied worldwide today, the energy consumed by all of the world's data centers would reduce by more than 50%. And this is a pretty impressive comment, and we hope over the next 30 minutes to share with you some of the reasons why we're confident in making that particular statement. The three key areas we'll be talking about today is we'll, we'll share a little bit about how Open Compute started and where it is today, and then spend the majority of our time on how OCP drives the efficiency of a data center, as well as specific numbers and the impact on Europe. This is a clip from 2010. Um, this is when Facebook first announced that it would start building its own data centers. And from 2010, the reason they started to look at building their own data centers is due to their rapid growth. Um, they were growing quite substantially at that time, and their, time, and, and their team at that, at that time, their infrastructure team, was not that big. Um, however, like most large, fast-growing organizations, they were working directly with manufacturers of designs of both data centers as well as the hardware that goes inside the data centers. But what was very different is that at that um, when they finished completing the data centers and when they finished their hardware designs, they took a community aspect of that and they opened up those designs, which had never been done before. So instead of having a black box where I'm not sure what goes into an actual server or how it's designed, Facebook opened up their networking, their storage, and their compute devices, as well as their data center designs um, to show what radically they've done different across all of their infrastructure. So from that genesis in 2011, they turned it into a technical nonprofit. That technical nonprofit consists of board members with Goldman Sachs, Microsoft, Rackspace, as well as Andy Becklesheim, who is the co-founder of Sun and sits on the board of Arista. So from that, we've grown the organization into the Open Compute Project. The Open Compute Project is a technical nonprofit consisting of well over 200 companies now, driving open compute designs across the technology uh, uh, inside the data center as well as the data center designs, focusing on four key aspects. Everything that comes through the foundation needs to have an efficiency angle. Number two, it needs to be able to scale. Third, it needs to have an impact. So a contribution's impact on either uh, existing designs or something new and different that will help propel the industry. And lastly is openness. It needs to be able to uh, work within open source concepts, open designs, being able to share and collaborate with other designs and other communities. So those are the four key cornerstones that we have that drive the open compute projects. So what kind of companies are participating in OCP? Uh, well, as I'd mentioned, we have well over 200, but these are some of the, the top members. And uh, what I'd like to point out on this is these are customers, manufacturers, solution providers. It's a mix because unlike a standards body, which is really driven by producers or manufacturers that created a standard and then an end customer may or may not adopt that standard, and unlike a multi-source partner agreement where you have consumers gather their um, purchasing power and then ask a few producers to make a particular product, 
in the open compute world, we have end customers sitting next to manufacturers working on a design and a concept and then bringing products to market within 100 days of that specification being released. So it is really true an open source environment that's producing actual results. Like other open source organizations, we run on a project basis. So we have volunteers that run across 10 projects. The four core projects are networking, server storage, and rack and power. And then underneath that, we have broader sets of specialized products around the data center, telco, hardware management, open systems firmware, HPC, and security. And I think throughout the course of this presentation, you'll see how certain projects have come to light that, that uh, span multiple projects, but then still drive efficiency, scale, impact, and openness in the data center. In the last six months, we've also developed a few sub-projects which would be of interest to the audience. One is advanced cooling, and we'll get more into detail around what companies are doing on the advanced cooling, but this has been one of our fastest growing areas of interest, uh, specifically in Europe. We've also seen a great deal of growth on the edge components, and that's happening primarily in the telco sector. And lastly is the modular data center. We've had strong European presence driving modular data center designs under the data center project. So I'll give you a couple of examples of what actually comes out of open compute when companies get together and, and, and work on either a networking or a storage component or a data center facilities project. Uh, on the left hand side, you'll see an announcement from Edgecore Networks earlier this year uh, where they've um, introduced 400 gig open networking designs. And they worked with end customers such as Facebook um, to develop this type of networking gear and then have contributed this design, both the specification and the product into the foundation. And then on the right hand side, you'll see Microsoft's uh, announcement around their SSD storage spec for the Open Compute project. Again, working with a group of companies developing new SSD storage specs, um, then manufacturers can take those specifications and deliver real value to the market. One of the other key contributions that we've had that was announced just um, a few weeks ago is around the modular data center. And this is driven uh, primarily by the lead out of uh, Sweden from Swedish modules. And I encourage you to take a look at the YouTube link um, that I've embedded here. It gives you a presentation on, on how they started the project within Open Computes, who they collaborated with, and how they've reached a particular design, which is now public for everyone to see. One of the other interesting things that we've seen a lot of growth in is around the colo area. Um, most companies uh, are, are not necessarily out building their own data centers. They're leveraging existing facilities um, either at a wholesale or at a co-location facility. And so in the past year, we've had a lot of organizations want to deploy open compute solutions. And there are some differences around open compute um, hardware compared to traditional legacy hardware. And so our team has put together in the entire data center facilities project, put together guidelines where colos can now take these reference guidelines, walk through their facility, and ensure that their facility is ready to handle, deploy, and support open compute solutions. And that, again, is available online um, for all members and everyone in the world to, to download and walk through their facility and see how their facility would measure up toward these guidelines. So those are a few examples, both on the hardware side around switch, storage, and including data center designs at the modular side, as well as helping colos understand the new wave of technology that drives efficiencies. Hello there. Right, I'll take over now. John LeBan here. Um, I'm going to concentrate a bit more on the energy aspects of data centers. I'll take about 15 minutes to do this. So here we go. Some of the questions that um, the OCP community have been asking, <clears throat> what can we remove from a data center system? Can we raise operating temperatures? 
and have servers still survive? Now, there's a very interesting number that you might want to take away in a traditional enterprise data center. They tend to run their temperatures on the intakes of their servers at very, very low temperatures. Uh, 22 is not unusual, 22 degrees C. Now, if you raise the temperature on the front of a server by just one degree, you can potentially reduce the overall power consumed in that data center. The overall energy can be reduced by three to five percent. So it's really important that you can raise that temperature on the front of the server. And ultimately, once you get that temperature up, you can do away with all the mechanical chilling, and that has a huge impact on the energy efficiency in the data center. Now, other things that the OCP community have done, they've removed the centralized UPS, all the inefficiencies involved with that. Consequently, what you'll always see in an OCP data center, you'll see PUEs better than 1.1. Now that is a huge energy saving compared to the traditional enterprise data centers where global averages are somewhere in the region of 1.6 to 1.8. The OCP hackers, I'd like to call them, the open source hackers question everything. They question the history of data centers. Why do we use 19 inch relay racks? Well, the history is we use them for electromechanical relays. That's the module that goes into the container, the rack. But we don't use that today. Today, what we put into racks, we'll put modules in that are like this. Hard disk drives, for example. Now, what's interesting about this, if you just widen the vertical rails inside the physical server rack, you can install a lot more modules. So in a typical 19 inch rack, you can only put four of these hard drives across the width of the rack. Whereas in an OCP with a slightly wider vertical fixing, you can put an extra one in, you can increase the density inside the rack by 25%. So it's using the physical assets much more efficiently by optimizing the space. Now, why do we use accessible floors in computer rooms? Again, this is a history thing that the OCP community have said, well, why do we continue doing it? It was, goes back to the days of IBM mainframes, liquid cooled mainframes and the access floors were for putting water pipes under the floor. Now, what uh, has happened as a result of the fact that there were access floors in mainframe rooms, when the air cooling came in, people just put in air grills and thought that was a smart way of doing things. But it's not a smart way. It, it doesn't even take account of the basic physics that we all learned and loved when we were children, that it, takes into, it does not take into account air buoyancy. The best way to put cool air into a warm room is through the ceiling, not through the floor, because then you need less fan power to put the cool air into the room. Now, just having a look at the fans inside um, traditional servers. Up the top there, you see all these small 40 millimeter diameter fans. And at the bottom, you'll see two 80 millimeter diameter fans. Now, at the bottom, you're seeing a typical fan configuration inside an OCP cubby server, as we call it. Now, it's pushing the air through with two larger fans rather than six or eight small fans. Now, one of the reasons why OCP servers are just so if much more efficient at low server utilization and are idle is because of this fan technology. They've changed the profile from a pizza box traditional to this cubby profile so they can get bigger fans in. Now, there's something called the fan cube law and the fan cube law is this. If you reduce the energy on a fan by seven eighths, you do that by reducing the speed by 50%. So reduce the speed by 50%, you reduce the energy to spin that fan by seven eighths. That's called the fan cube law. 
So if we compare these two fan configurations of the small 40 millimeter fans with the two 80 millimeter, the two 80 millimeter fans, as you would see in an OCP server, are using roughly one tenth of the energy compared to the traditional solution. One tenth of the energy just for the fans. Now what this is going to show, this is going to show all the stuff that you would remove from a traditional faulty server rack. Um, and I'm basically going to turn it into an OCP rack and we're just going to click through and you'll see the objects removed. So there are all the fans gone, the power supply units go because we don't have power supplies. The green things at the back are the intelligent power strips. That object that just disappeared is the downflow crack. We don't use downflow cracks. We don't use access floors. And all the cabling is done at the front and there's a lot less of it. So with an OCP solution, this is all the stuff that we get rid of, the 20th century dross. And the technician only has to work on the front. He doesn't have to go to the back. So this is a real big benefit of OCP, that you can run the backs of the racks very, very hot because nobody goes into them. And that's a considerable saving on materials. Now, if we just run through the data center design, this is a traditional, we've got the centralized UPS, all the centralized chillers. They all disappear when we move towards an OCP solution. We've got rid of the chillers, we've got rid of the centralized UPS, and we move on and eventually we see an OCP data center. So what we do, we embed lithium ion techno uh, battery technologies into the racks and we get superior efficiencies and we get much smaller failure domains. With a centralized UPS, when that centralized UPS fails, it takes out the whole data center. The kind of efficiencies we get here are about up to 97.5% efficiencies, whereas on the other solutions, you might be only be seeing 80% efficiencies on those previous designs. So let's have a look at some of the numbers and the impact on Europe. This is a, a recent um, survey that was done um, by IHS Market and I'd recommend everybody to watch the video, the online video from the Amsterdam OCP summit, all about this. And it was specific to Europe and it raised some very, very interesting um, um, approaches to energy efficiency in Europe. And I believe Europe is leading the way and um, OCP data centers are streets ahead in terms of energy efficiency even to the, what the Europeans are doing at the moment, but the Europeans are actually taking the best practices from OCP and applying them. Now, this is an interesting one. What plans do these people who were interviewed in the survey have over the next two years? And the two green ones at the top are worth noting. Heat, energy, reuse. 22% of those interviewed will be implementing Heat energy reuse. And just below that, the use of liquid cooling. Now, it's quite interesting that they're the same percentage, the 22%. Now, when you start to implement liquid cooling inside your computer rooms, it fits perfectly with heat reuse because typically on a air-cooled rack, an air-cooled computer rack, if you want to use that heat that's coming out of the back of the rack, you have to put it through a heat pump and you have to inject lots of energy into it to raise the temperature of that uh, air such that you provide water into the district heating system at high enough temperature. Now when you start using liquid, you get these high temperatures anyway and it removes the need for the heat pump so they are super efficient compared to air-cooled solutions. 
So there's a real synergy between these two. Now, what it's leading to, it's leading towards combined heat and compute. Now, you're going to see more of this. Combined heat and compute is where you use the data center to provide heat into something for reuse outside of the data center. Now, these projects are now starting in Europe. Um, I'm aware of probably at the moment, and they're growing fast, less than two dozen at the moment and some of them are at huge scale if you look here for example at the Facebook OCP data center this is in Odense in Denmark and this will be supplying heat to I think it's around about 8,000 houses in Odense so this is a real big area of growth and it's happening fast now just a few examples of things that have happened. It's been going on for some time. OVH are a huge um, internet service provider. They are now part of the OCP community and they're bringing their specialism of liquid cooling into the OCP community and sharing that with us. And what's interesting, they have a huge infrastructure, huge infrastructure. It says here 350,000 servers, but they're probably near 400,000 servers today. So imagine the potential if we can use these facilities for heat. There's other examples there, Alibaba, again, all these are players inside the open compute community. The eco design regulations in Europe, we've been working very, very closely with the Eureka project and the project uh, lead on that, uh, Rabbi Burush, from the University of East London. And it's very interesting that um, how the OCP servers are way in front of the proprietary servers, especially on energy efficiency at low server utilization at idle. Um, and I'll show you a few examples of that. Now, this is going to be legislation that's going to come through in two years' time. And you will start to see the withdrawal, the end of life of other products. But let me just show you some of the um, comparisons. What we have here, we have a comparison. This was done by SK Telecom. SK Telecom, the major player in the Korean telecom market. And what they did, they did a comparison between OCP servers and traditional servers. And what they found at workload 0% idle, they found roughly a 50% less energy was used. When you push the servers up to 100% utilization workload, then you can see there they were seeing around about an 18, 19, 20% kind of um, a reduction in energy by comparison. Now, it's not just on the servers, it's also applicable to the switching technologies and the network technologies. The London Internet Exchange uh, has migrated towards open source solutions based on OCP switches. And just two bits to point, the two bits in green there, the two lines, uh, as a result, they saw a 40% reduction in energy consumption and over 50% savings in space. Now, again, this is a presentation from the Amsterdam OCP Summit, and we'll provide later links to this for you, and you can go and have a look. Now, just a few more end users and research institutes that have been uh, doing comparisons. If we look at CERN, now CERN have been using OCP equipment for their HPC, their high performance clusters, for probably four years now, I think it must be. And what they're showing is that when they implement OCP servers into their HPC clusters, if they're running those servers at 80% utilization, they've seen a 29% reduction in energy on those servers. Now, Booking.com have recently done that as well. They've done a comparison. Now, they've actually done a comparison with blade servers, the traditional proprietary blade server. And what they've found is at low utilization, 
the OCP servers uh, use 40% less energy. Now, blade servers always were being pushed as having much better energy efficiency than the standard pizza box single server. And yet the OCP servers are showing a 40% less energy. Now, this is such an interesting topic and we need to get the story out because I don't think we are enough. Um, RISE, that's the research institute in Sweden, have now got somewhere in the region of about one and a half thousand OCP servers. And they'll be conducting some really interesting research on energy efficiency in the coming months and we'll get that released and I think that will start to uh, open up eyes in the uh, in the industry. Now if we start to look at embedded energy, what the OCP community have also done, they are now reusing the hyperscaler OCP hardware. So the hyperscaler being the big boys, the big players like the Facebooks of this world, that hardware is now coming out of those large hyperscale installations and it's being reused in the smaller data centers and at huge scale, at huge scale. And this is really interesting. So basically what's happening is the OCP community have developed a circular economy. This is not scrapping the equipment like, like would be done historically, it is a, a reuse. So now why is that possible on OCP but it's not on the other solutions is because OCP removes this concept of gratuitous product differentiation. So what it is, you can put an OCP server from various manufacturers into the rack chassis. Now you can't do that with traditional solutions. You can't do that with a blade center. You can't take a blade from a HP server and put it into a Dell chassis. Whereas with OCP, you can. It encourages this openness. So that's a really good thing and it's happening really fast. So the communities are driving the innovation. Um, there's a, an interesting um, piece that I read some time back, which was um, open source hackers are just completely oblivious of what they're doing to the traditional industries. Um, they have fun, they produce really good product, very efficient in terms of energy, and they're having a huge impact. Now, it's all going a bit, um, OCP are kind of coming out of the woodwork at the moment. It's only just starting to move into the, the enterprise space. OCP is dominant in the hyperscale space. You know, the big boys, the, the Microsofts of this world, they adopt millions of these servers, um, but it's now moving into the enterprise space, basically copying the best practices from the hyperscale, the best uh, open source practices. And there's a real impact happening across Europe where this adoption is moving into the enterprise space and also government space. The Swedish government have also specified OCP as part of their new G cloud infrastructure because they see the benefits on the open source and especially the energy efficiency of the OCP servers. So let's watch this space. And again coming back to this thought for the day, if the current OCP designs, and I'm talking about the current OCP designs, I'm not talking about the stuff that's coming along, you know, within the next few months. And the innovation that happens in the OCP community is, is, is very, very fast. As I describe it, it's like Moore's law on open source steroids. It's moving very quickly. And if we applied these current designs and practices globally today, we would reduce the energy consumed in the world's data centers today by more than 50%. So thank you very much. Uh, we hope that you have found this uh, beneficial and please feel free to reach out to either John or myself anytime uh, with any additional questions. We'd be happy to share um, as much information as possible. And again, the uh, links will be embedded within the presentation.
Thank you both for sharing your excellent work by the open compute. While much of the data center sector's growth has taken place in North America and Europe in past years, the Asia Pacific region is now furiously taking to the front of the race. We are honored to invite Dr. Li Jie, Vice Chairman of the Open Data Center Committee in China, to tell us more about data center energy efficiency development in China. Please, Dr. Li. Hello, everyone. I'm Li Jie from CAICT. I'm very glad to have this opportunity to introduce you to the development situation of energy saving in China's data center. First, a brief introduction to CAICT. Founded in 1957, the China Academy of Information and Communications Technology is a scientific research institute directly under the Ministry of Industry and Information Technology of China. CAICT provides strong support for the industry's major strategies, plans, policies, standards, testing, and certification, thus proving itself an important facility in the leapfrog development and the innovation of China's information and communications industry. The Cloud Computing and Big Data Research Institute is a new core business unit established in October 2017 by the CAICT for the continuous development of new technologies, new industries, new models, and new formats. Our department is the data center research department, focused on data center related government support, technology research, standard setting, evaluation testing, industry consulting, platform operation, training exchange, and so on. The energy saving development of data center is one of the key research demands of our department. I will introduce the energy saving development of China's data center from three aspects. First, China's data center energy saving policies. Second, the development situation of China's data center energy saving. Third, China's data center typical energy saving technology. The first is the policies. The relevant government departments of the data center have always paid close attention to the energy saving development of the data center and issue various policies to promote the green development of the data center. Such as in 2013, the five ministries, including the MIT and the National Development and the Reform Commission, issued guiding opinions on the layout of data centers, which classified the data center construction area into four types of area and encouraged the construction of large scale and outer large data center, especially for those applications without high real-time requirements. The key points are to consider the climate, energy supply, and other factors for site selection. And the priority should be given to the construction of energy-friendly and climate-friendly area. And the policy guidance, Guizhou in Mongolia and other energy-rich and climate-friendly region actively carry out the data center layout guidance, which effectively promoted the overall layout optimization of China's data center industry. In 2015, the State Council of China issued the opinions on promoting the innovation and the development of cloud computing and uh, cultivating the new format of the information industry and uh, proposed the goal of optimizing the infrastructure and co coordinating the task of 
origin the cloud computing infrastructure. In 2017, the MIT released the guidance on stressing the energy conservation and emission reduction work of the 13th five-year information and communication industry and proposed the goal of building a large-scale and ultra-large data center with a PUE 1.4 or less and the key task of innovation and the promotion the green data center technology. In 2017, MIIT issued a notice on organizing the application for the demonstration based on the national new industrialization industry. For the first time, the data center was included in the scope and the support was given to select some large scale and ultra large data center gathering area in the forefront of the country with high priority, as well as medium and small sized data centers that reach higher standards. Among them, green energy conservation is an important condition. On the one hand, it's a hard index for large scale data centers IT equipment load is required to reach 40% of design capacity and the data center PUE is less than or equal to 1.5. For the small and medium sized data centers, the IT equipment load is required to reach 50% uh, of the design capacity and the average running PUE is less than or equal to 1.7. On the other hand, there are additional points, including the data center is awarded the relevant green certification, such as the data center green level assessment, level 3A or above certification, install power and energy monitoring software and hardware, platform and realize data traceability. Clear energy efficiency improve goals are needed. Support data center to adopt green renewable energy such as wind power and solar energy. In China, economically developed places such as Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou and Shenzhen are also the places with the greatest demand for data centers. But they are also areas where land, electricity, and water resources are tight. The government has been adopting various policies to promote the layout and the construction of data centers so that healthy development of data center industry can be promoted. In various local places, energy efficiency is also the main focus of policies. For example, in 2018, Beijing issued a probation and restriction catalog. It is forbidden to build and expand the data center in the downtown area. Only the cloud data center with PUE less than 1.4 is allowed outside the downtown area. In Shanghai, strictly control the total construction scale of the data center, improve the energy efficiency of the data center, and uh, prioritize the construction of data center using advanced the energy saving technologies. So what's the overall situation of energy efficiency in China's data center? In 2013, ultra large and large data center average design PUE was 1.48. Media and small data center average design PUE was 1.8. In 2016, Arch large and large data center average design PUE was 1.45.
ultra large data center average running PoE is 1.5. Large data center average running PoE is 1.69. In 2017, ultra large and large data center average design PoE was 1.41, 1.48. Large data center average running PoE was 1.54, and the optimal running is about 1.2. From the change of PoE in recent years, we can see that China's data center energy efficiency has improved steadily. So what kind of energy saving technology has been adopted in China's data center to improve the energy efficiency. Here, I briefly introduce some representative energy saving technologies. IT equipment is the business barrier of the data center. For IT equipment, how to maximize power efficiency is the first issue to consider when designing. From multi-node server, rack server, to micro-module data center, efficiency customization of IT equipment is a trend of energy efficiency of data center IT equipment. Among them, Scorpia rack server is a new type of server designed by Chinese user such as Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent. Scorpio Server has developed rapidly and have achieved rapid development. By the end of 2017, the total deployment scale of Scorpio Rack Server was about 15,000 racks, with nearly 500,000 service solutions. The output value will reach 15 billion yuan saving users investment by 1 to 1.5 billion yuan and saving 200 million kilowatt hour of electricity. The module data center will move the construction of data center from worksite to factory through proof fabrication and outside installation. It can be deployed in 40 days. Grid reduced the traditional two or three years of construction period. In units of module, it can be quickly and flexibly deployed according to the requirements. The module data center is efficient, flexible, faster, and energy saving. It has been rapidly applied in many industries, such as internet, telecommunications, and government. According to the Open Data Center Committee in statistics, in the past five years, the module data center has deployed about 130,000 standard racks, and the number of servers is close to 2 million. The average PUE of data center is reduced by 0 0.2 to 0 0.4. The operating cost is reduced by 20% to 40%, and the energy saving and reduction effect is obviously. Talk about the cooling mode. Uh, with the rapid development of AI and other technologies, especially after the deployment of uh, GPU and the TPU, the server power has been greatly improved. Traditional air cooling has not been able to achieve the requirement, heat dissipation capacity, and liquid cooling has gradually become a new mode of data center cooling. At present, liquid cooling mainly has three deployment modes, cold plate, immersion, and spring. The cold plate does the need to directly contact the heat generating device and the requirement 
and the transformation of the origin IT infrastructure are minimal and the application progress is fast. Immersion liquid cooling allow the heat device to directly contact the liquid, which has the highest heat dissipation efficiency and technical difficult. Alibaba has deployed the immersion liquid cooling in Zhangbei's data center. The spray type is still in the early stage of deployment and the stage of technological breakthrough. And there haven't been large scale deployment cases. The degree of marketization of liquid cooling is greatly strengthened. And the, the application programs are greatly used in the field of internet, finance, media, etc. We believe that liquid cooling is an important direction in the de development of data center cooling technology. In addition, in terms of power supply from dual UPS to power direct supply and HVDC, the power supply efficiency can be increased to 94 to 95%. In recent years, Internet data centers have explored 12 volt, 48 volt power supply mode. Overall, the power supply system gradually improve efficiency, reduce cost, and simplify operation and maintenance. The above is my sharing. Thank you for listening. Have any questions? Please feel free to communicate. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee, for your comprehensive presentation and valuable insights. Dear participants, time flies with good discussions. If you find our webinar helpful, we will be much appreciated. Are there any topics you would like us to address in the next webinar? Please get in touch through the email on the screen. We are looking forward to hearing from you. Until next time.